we're talking about investing in the future, I think one of the, the first things we have to talk about is, is data, um, especially when it comes to innovation. Uh, the OSC recently did a really cool thing, uh, a hackathon, which is pretty cool for a regulator to do. Uh, RegHack TO uh, uh, released a report following the, the hackathon, uh, basically, I would say key learnings on uh, the regulation of Canadian fintech, uh, asking that, uh, or stating that open data and data standardization is, quote, essential for advancing uh, fintech solutions. So Pat, I wanna ask you a little bit about uh, the motivation behind uh, a hackathon like that, and then what, what led you to that conclusion? Okay. Um, so I'm leading OSC Launchpad at the OSC, and I think you heard from a number of the keynote speakers this morning that we need to be changing how we think about regulation and our regulatory framework. So that's really the context for this initiative. And, you know, as you said, it's unusual for a regulator to have a hackathon, but we really wanted to demonstrate that we are open to new technologies, new novel solutions um, in the financial services uh, industry. Um, we recognize, just for context to everyone, we, we regulate securities in the investment industry, not payments directly, but obviously payments go towards investing and savings and um, all uh, good things that we'd like Canadians to be doing. Um, so we brought together a number of teams over a weekend and we posed to them uh, problem statements, problem statements that we're all grappling with, uh, both as an industry and as regulators. And at the end of it, we uh, had 22 unique solutions, uh, great solutions around um, how do we utilize blockchain uh, around reg tech, KYC client identity, uh, financial literacy, and even transparency. Um, so to your point, uh, we had key learnings, and I if you haven't seen our video or our white paper, please look at oscelaunchpad.ca. I think the, it, it really is a bit of an eye-opener. It gave us huge insight into what's happening in this industry. So the key learnings were obviously a recognition of the power of many of these technologies, whether it's artificial intelligence or blockchain. Um, number two, collaboration. I think you heard a lot about that this morning, uh, both uh, regulatory industry and government, I think needs to happen. But going to the question that uh, Doug asked is um, the importance of open data. And I think we have seen, we've talked to a number of regulators worldwide, and a number of them have got open data initiatives, whether it's the UK, uh, Euro the European uh, PSD2, Australia, and I think there's a recognition that if we're going to support innovation in the financial services industry, we need to have open data. And it's important to the fintechs because that's how they're able to do their, whether it's the analytical trends or looking at the data, what does that show about us as an investing community, as consumers, and, and how can we help um, Canada be a leader in this, in this space? Okay, um, so that, that's great context to start. Uh, and I'm, I think I'm gonna, because I, uh, messed up my own schedule of this. I'm gonna run through the group and allow them to introduce themselves as well, but then answering this question, because I noted in the report, uh, it, it, as you said, uh, right up front, it said that uh, this open data and the opportunities here and standardization are great for uh, customers and specifically regulators, but maybe not necessarily some of the, the FinTech companies who might benefit from uh, proprietary data and holding on to that. So let, let, I, wanna, I wanna run through uh, the rest of the panel, have everyone introduce themselves, and then maybe jump on in, in on this, is that if you agree that this is a component of FinTech innovation in the future uh, or not, and some of the opportunities that you are identifying, so, so Jeff, go for it. Yeah, so good morning, Jeff Middleman, CEO of Thinking Capital, uh, somewhat of a elder statesman in the FinTech space. Thinking Capital has been in business for 10 years. Uh, we are uh, focused entirely on Canada. We are a small business lender and um, in our capacity as a lender, we have served more than 15,000 unique businesses and deployed more than half a billion dollars uh, of capital uh, into an area that, that we think of as, uh, as the credit white space. Uh, and, and that's really at the disconnect of, of where small businesses you know, typically wish to borrow and, and banks have trouble lending. And uh, uh, we have two approaches. One is a direct to market approach. The, uh, the second one is, uh, is through partnership. We call that approach lending as a service. And uh, we, we are proud to be associated with many great brands, including uh, CIBC, Moneris, Everlink, Staples, UPS, 
uh, all for, for the purposes of delivering a better lending experience uh, to, their, uh, to their small business customers. Um, on the uh, on the subject of uh, of data, uh, the you know I would I would say that is top three of, of the challenges that, that we have as uh, as a lender uh, be, because typically uh, access to to data in Canada is is quite challenging. Uh, there there are not there's not a lot of data available in in uh, in a way that we can consume dynamically through uh, through API. So so what we found ourselves doing uh, disproportionately is is going in. Uh, Creating proprietary relationships around data, uh, particularly with those partners that uh, that we have. So, uh, so if there was, you know, a, a kind of uh, a publicly uh, uh, acceptable standard or or a uh, you know a uh, a general acceptance that uh, of of how data should be shared, uh, I, I think uh, I think that would fast track our industry tremendously. So, so what what types of data in in that kind of portfolio are the the real sticking points for you where you guys have to go proprietary? Uh, so, so with us, it's all transactional data. So we aggregate everything from, uh, you know, payments data to um, inflows and outflows of uh, of the bank account, uh, personal credit data, trade data. Uh, it, it's pretty varied. Okay. All right, Dinero, let's get you jumping in. Yes. Good morning. Uh, I'm happy to be here. My name is Dinero Lee. I am the director of the finance and commerce group at Mars Discovery District. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Mars, we are North America's largest global innovation hub. Uh, specifically within four sectors that we function in. Uh, finance and commerce is one of them. Work and learning, which is also known as ed tech, is the other. Energy and environment, which used to be clean tech, is the other. And last but not least is the health uh, sector. So our role is to really help catalyze and work with startups in the growth and scale phases to help them achieve scale and basically exportability internationally. And so we've seen you know, quite a significant amount of growth in the last two years since we've launched the, the fintech sector, so to speak. And I'm, I'm definitely encouraged and privileged to have met founders like Jeff and Christian here with me on stage uh, to really see uh, amazing solutions being developed to, to help Canada be a leader in fintech innovation because we all know that we need to do more. We all have a role to play. Uh, but more importantly, to provide the support necessary for founders and for entrepreneurs to be successful because they are ultimately leading on the cutting edge of many new technologies and platforms and experiences for customers in this country. And so it's, in, it's really imperative that you know, organizations like Mars are, is equipped with the right resources uh, to support them in various aspects, whether it's talent, whether it's capital, whether it's you know, customers. And so you know, we work with a lot of industry folks, whether it's banks, regulators, policymakers, Corporates, you know, the, the wide range, and as a nonprofit charity, uh, we really rely on the, the collaboration that we continue to you know, tell with all these industry stakeholders. And it's, it's so critical. And you know, I'll touch a little bit on the, the open data component, which I very much agree is very critical. Um, if you look at the trends around the world, you know, one of the things that Mars wanted to do when we first launched was build a partnership with Yodley and. Uh, out uh, in the U.S. And if, for those who don't know what Yodli is, is an open banking API platform that aggregates uh, and anonymizes banking data and gives it you know, accessible to companies and third-party providers to build solutions on and ingest. And so you know, th that has taken off very well for us in terms of providing it as a pro bono service for entrepreneurs and founders to, again, build on top of so they can understand who their customers are, their behaviors, how they can service them, and sort of, again, layer on top of their experiences with the technology that they're leveraging. And so very much uh, critical to the conversation, I think, and banks like BBVA, have, for example, have announced recently that they're opening up eight of their APIs in the industry, which will be accessible globally. And these are the types of, you know, depending on the lens you have, could be opportunities and potential threats, you know, to our ecosystem, because if our banking system, you know, doesn't get ahead of this, international banks will. Right? So I'll leave it at that for now, and then hopefully we'll have more conversation yeah. and color around it. So, so quick follow-up. Are uh, companies, startups in your kind of Mars portfolio saying what Jeff is saying, that this is like a top three high-level concern? Yeah, I mean, it, it also, so it's one of the things that they've concerned uh, and expressed challenges around, as Jeff mentioned, but uh, the other ones is around talent, and it's around capital at certain stages, and of course, uh, customers. So, so those are the sort of three main pillars, and on top of that, access to open data. Okay, uh, Christian, uh, 
Gennaro said a really interesting word that I'm glad he said, an anonymize when we're talking about data. Um, and I think surrounding all of this conversation, I think uh, in many of the tech verticals that Betica covers, uh, open data, data standardization is kind of uh, par for the course. Um, in, in FinTech and with payments, uh, there's a, a, a trickier element because the uh, expectations of privacy and security and what comes to the customer level uh, in big, bold le letters, trust is a, a really big issue. So um, for, from Dream Payments perspective, uh, how do you guys approach uh, that, that data fidelity, open data, when, when it's, it, you're the front line of uh, a lot of different customers, right. very personal information? Absolutely. So my name is Christian Ali. I'm Chief Marketing Officer at Dream Payments. Dream is a mobile commerce cloud, if you will, that powers payments across mobile devices and the IoT. Um, banks use and, and payment acquirers use Dream to power their mobile point of sale solutions. So we have a white label product that guys like Chase Payment Tech are using. We have a partnership with TD. We have a deep integration with um, third party app providers such as uh, QuickBooks. We're mostly known for having the only chip and pin solution in Canada or North America for that fact that you can purchase off the shelf, download the app and start taking interact debit and credit card payments within 20 minutes. So as you guys know, Canada is an EMV mature market. Everything that we're talking about today or so far talks about you know compliance around EMV, if you look at it that way, um, standardization. But to the point around open data, you're right, trust is, is what our brand is about, right? When, you, when you're in financial services and you're a FinTech or you're a startup or you're a brand out there, what you're building is trust. So it's very, very important how you manage that data. So from my perspective or Dream's perspective, I think open data is great, but for the vertical that we play in within FinTech, it's less about the open data, it's more about standardization of data and being able to leverage um, AL and ML and being able to, you know, all the stuff that we heard about contextual um, analysis yesterday and being able to make sense of things and see patterns that, you know, machines can see but humans can't. So that's and how... It, this, just following up on that, is that because uh, with your business specifically you have so many touch points that you need to integrate with that I'm assuming you're doing a lot of heavy lifting to transfer data through the system? It's, it's not so much that because everything, if you look at Dream as a gateway of the transaction, we have all the data, right? So we need to analyze that data. It's a competitive advantage for us as a service okay. provider. And if we're going to integrate, you know, our whole thing is that we're helping small businesses succeed and we're helping larger institutions help their small business customers succeed. So the way you do that is several fold. One, you need an innovative technology that's a differentiator that provides value. But you also need to be able to take the apps and the tools and the services that people already love to use today. They're great things, right? The biggest issue that small businesses will tell you is that they have some great tools, but they all don't work well together. So it's about interoperability from that perspective. Okay, so um, it's interesting. So the, the, the standardization is opportunity for, um, uh, I think, both your businesses to really leverage and capitalize. But how do you how do you pass that across to the customer expectation, especially when you're, you we're starting to mention here machine learning, AI, uh, whether anonymized or not capabilities to uh, extract a lot of value, but then there's also uh, a broader expectation of uh, trust coming with that. We've just seen recently uh, in the U.S. a lot of blow up around Uber, some New York Times reports on information that they were uh, buying from third party services that was anonymized, was opt-in, but st still led to uh, a certain level of revolt. So maybe, um, uh, I guess we'll go, maybe Christian or Jeff, how do, how, do you, how, do you, how do you balance that expectation and being upfront with what you're doing with the data? And then maybe Pat, um, talk a little bit about uh, how you're keeping eyes on these people and the way that they're using this data. So uh, I'll start, I mean, a lot of it is, opting in, right? Um, so to share data anytime, so we have a deep integration of QuickBooks. Uh, you take Dream, you connect it to QuickBooks, it takes literally two minutes to do, so every payment transaction you take on a Dream device automatically flows into QuickBooks in real time, updates the taxes, decrements the inventory. So there's a data exchange that happens. We had to, to change our terms and conditions, right? And the customer had to accept that. So it's all about presenting that, educating the customer. 
you know, we all know that there are different types of, of consumers out there. They're the guys that don't use Facebook and don't use any social media and really restrict their use of online information. And then there's, let's call them millennials and, and other generations that just don't care. It's out there, right? So it, it's being able to develop a product and service. We live in an idea economy, right? The, the ability to bring value um, to market of a product or service faster than your competition, right? That, that's what it's about today. And you gotta remove all the friction, the obstacles and all that type of stuff. So at the same time, you can't expose yourself. So you do have to present it out there. The problem is that consumers are conditioned to just click through without reading. And you'll find regionally that's addressed and managed differently. In Canada, we have Castle, right? So we can't just spam people. However, the HVAC guys call me once a month, no matter what I say, and tell me to blacklist me. So yeah. it's different. Okay. Jeff, you got anything there? Yeah, sure. Uh, so so we've, uh, we, we have two approaches. Uh, one, one is uh, we'll, we'll take them through a, uh, uh, you know, a consent form, and, and generally those are dictated by the partners. So as you can imagine, when, uh, when, when a bank or a large institution puts forth a, a, uh, a consent form before sharing their data, it's, uh, it's fairly onerous and, and there's, uh, there's, there's no way of not knowing what it is that, uh, that, that, that you're doing there. Uh, the, the second thing we've done, and this is, this is really where, where the, the tech piece comes in, um, is, is we have repackaged uh, a part of our front end uh, to basically allow the partner to be able to actually make a decision in their own environment without sharing data with us. So we've given them some technology that they then expose their, their data to. Um, none of that data flows back to us. Uh, they, then, they then make a decision and then the, the onboarding process uh, is what follows. So once they've, they've, uh, they've, uh, a lending decision has been made in the partner's environment uh, and it's something that they want to proceed with, we will then put the consent afterwards and then all of that data will, will be packaged up and, and uh, um, and passed back to us, and, and what you get there um, is, is you've given them a whole lot of value before you've asked them to consent to share anything. Yeah. Is, okay, so in, in talking, look, always looking at this go forward in terms of innovation and setting the conditions, do you think that that is something, uh, when you're talking about open up lending and services to kind of, to new markets, you, you've done, I was gonna talk about this later, but you've done some like really interesting uh, partnerships with your lending as a service, to maybe uh, for, for different types of small businesses in certain verticals, I'm thinking, partnership with Touch Bistro to get kind of restaurants in there. People who might, um, with traditional services, not feel really comfortable going through that process, but because you're providing that value up front, there's a, there's a fr friction reduction to get, maybe get them onboarded. Is that, is that a, is a broader opportunity across the board with FinTech? Uh, so, so specific to lending, we, we think the, uh, the, the killer experience in lending is, uh, is on-demand availability. So, so in those things that, uh, in those interfaces that you interact with on a daily basis, uh, be it your bank account, be it your payments app, be it your accounting software, um, every time you should log in, uh, the, the ability uh, for, for a value added service like, uh, like, like us as a lender, um, we should be ever present and we should tell you um, every time you log in uh, to an environment that you would normally interact with, this is the value that's available to you um, regardless of whether you need it at that point or not. And then at such time that you need it, okay, it's, it really is a, a form of click, click fun. Okay. Um, which, is, which is such a great experience because if you compare that to the experience that they have now, you know, take, take a whole bunch of paper, go into a branch, wait, yep. et cetera, um, as opposed to, you know, interact in your normal ecosystem, um, know, know it's available, understand what amounts are available, um, and, and uh, you know, opt in when, uh, when the need. Okay exists. Um, Pat, we've, we've heard terms and services, we've heard click, click, fun. Yeah. So <laughs> um, that, you know, for, uh, and uh, for, for some people, especially, you know, you know, on the millennial side, as a millennial representative, uh, the ease of access is a, is a compelling feature. When, when we're talking about, uh, when you're calling for open data and data standardization, how are you then looking to create a framework where customers are getting uh, kind of that, that thinking capital benefit where the value is up front uh, and not worried about what's gonna happen. And is there opportunities for like the OSC and regulators to get involved in leveraging that information to get smarter and keep up with uh, the people on stage here trying to push the, the needle right. forward? So I, I'm gonna differentiate it a little bit. So to me, open data and, and where we're saying we need an open data initiative is really around anonymized data. So 
that shouldn't be your personal and confidential client information, right? So I think that is important so that you have the data, you're able to run the types of new solutions or technology solutions on that data. Um, and I don't know the Uber experience specifically, but when it comes to personal and confidential information, um, that's something obviously that the client needs to consent to. So when I hear click, click, swipe, I worry, do, you know, do investors, do, do Canadians even know what they're agreeing to um, in some of these terms and, uh, terms and conditions? And, and we've seen it in Facebook, Google, all sorts of uh, areas. Um, so I do think that's something we would be very much involved in, in terms of cybersecurity. How, in your, how are you ensuring uh, client confidential information? One of the things we're encouraging, um, and we did this in, in the white paper as well, is client identity. Think about how many times you, you're, you give your personal information, whether it's to the bank, to a loan company, mortgage company, uh, credit card company. Um, is there an opportunity to eliminate some of the duplication and, and really get a really uh, secure uh, platform that's doing client identity so that you as the, as the client, as the consumer, have the opportunity and you can say what you're consenting to in terms of providing to your bank or to your lending uh, platform or um, you know payments company. So uh, I, it's something we're taking very seriously, obviously, but at the same time, I think there are great opportunities with the technologies that we're seeing uh, to make it more secure and to really allow the consumer to have control over their personal information. Okay. So, so we, got a, we got a yes on the standardized data, anonymized. What we're talking about here, I think, also relates to uh, questions of, of infrastructure, something that uh, Christian was kind of saying off the top. All the, all the different components that you have to uh, play with to make uh, a, a customer happy, to make the, the yeah. payment transact. Um, I happen to play basketball with your CEO, Brent Ho Young, uh, and over the years, I've heard him, uh, as you were prepping for launch, launching, going through the whole process of becoming a live fintech company, uh, lament <laughs> the difficult process of uh, achieving compliance when it comes, not necessarily to, just to FinTech, but when it comes to payments, transactions, uh, PCI compliance is a word that he, I think, mumbled to himself uh, on the daily. Uh, I know on BetaKit we've covered um, the, the two-year launch window of a company uh, in Vancouver called Coho, which is trying to do uh, a, a radically different way approaching uh, how millennials treat their money. Can you talk to me about, about the, the process of like how hard it is to hit compliance before you even really have a product and um, go forward? What, what are the opportunities maybe through tech to solve some of that? Sure. Um, so it's a great point. There's, there's a couple ways to look at it. One, I'll, I'll talk about from a dream perspective and also talk a little bit about a secure key perspective. So, you know, we are PCI compliant, we're EMV certified or whatnot. Um, and it took quite a while to accomplish. But we were able to do it in parallel with our product development. But it is also a barrier for entry, right, against competition. So from our perspective, it's an investment we made. Yes, it's a bit of a headache. Um, we have a, a leadership team that are 20-year veterans each within the industry, so we know how to navigate to get there. You have the problem within FinTech is we hear about a lot of startups, all these FinTechs, 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 and a lot of them launch a product and then they get shut down or something happens because they're non-compliant. And yeah. they don't even know they're non-compliant. They got this great idea and well, you know, a parent should have looked at that first is the way I kind of look at it. So before, you know, I'd say when we first launched, it was all about a device-centric, consumer-centric approach. So we launched our product and market. We have an EMV device. Again, you pick it up off a retailer and away you go. But then we started powering other organizations such as Chase. And with that, you have to replicate that hardware or that infrastructure. So we took a step back, and that's when we really transformed, I'd say, from a, a payment services provider, a mobile payment company, to, to a mobile or to a payment cloud company. So we have a partnership with IBM and VMware, uh, where before it used to take us literally months, three, four months to roll out a new environment. Or you just imagine that. If you're gonna test in a, a closed environment, you need to you know, segregate and segment and all that type of stuff, separate hardware often. Um, 
take three, four months. When we went to a VMware model or IBM model, cloud-based model, that's PCI compliant, we can replicate an entire environment within one day. So we can stand up a live production environment or a test environment or a pilot environment anywhere in the world where there's an IBM center and do the testing at a fraction of the cost of what it used to be. Okay. So you're seeing that you know, large organizations, uh, they spoke again, just to talk about IBM a bit, but they spoke yesterday about you know, all the, the AI and, and learning that they're doing. They acquired this organization of consultants <coughs> to, to teach uh, Watson. So what you're seeing is other organizations taking, understanding that compliance regulatory um, issues are, are necessary within the industry and trying to offer those services to smaller fintech companies. Uh, I, I really think the future is all about platforms. Um, it's not isolated solutions. So when you have you know, the data standardization, open data, interoperability, certified environments, um, public test box, sandboxes, if you will, it allows you to, to get to market faster. And, and really, that's, that's what the race is for all of us. Yeah, OK. Well, let, let's talk about that then. Because, um, and uh, De Niro, I want, I want your experience here. Because I, I think the, the adults in the room conversation is really important uh, when it comes to FinTech. You know, the previous speaker on, on St. Cheer was very much talking about like, the Canadian approach to things is very cautious and pragmatic, and yeah. that can have a lot of benefits. But um, you know. <laughs> Uh, that also might lead to the, the, the one knock on Canadian fintech that it's been a little slow on the uptick to really uh, do new and innovative things rather than uh, Canadian versions of U US products, right? So how, how do we get a scenario where the, the move fast, break things model can thrive uh, for younger companies while still existing in a, something that isn't highly illegal? Um, and what what is the access level like? You have you have a lot of adults at your company with senior connections, and I'm sure the work you're doing with IBM is, is amazing. But uh, Gennaro, for some of the companies that are coming through Mars, who uh, two people in a garage with a really great idea, what's what's the gap between their experience and uh, what they need to get a product out to test? Yeah, um, good question. I mean, the, the gap is fairly large, I would say. Um, and the challenge, I think, for us is to differentiate between the guys with a great idea, uh, but also with the companies that actually have market traction, right? So we, we definitely don't want to shove aside the guys who dream big, uh, because I think that's what is needed from a founder's perspective. You know, think about not just Canada, but global sort of expansion and customer distribution and access, right? But by the same token, what drives and magnetizes and energizes this industry is successful companies, right? So with an organization like Mars and the other regional innovation centers that exist within Ontario and in Canada, we have to collectively decide which horses to back in terms of resources. Because we are, we are a small country. Think of us as a small team that really is not against each other, but against the global stage, right? And so with New York and San Francisco and the Valley and Hong Kong and China and London, you know, these are markets that are constantly popping up when we talk about fintech, right? And so Canada needs to be inserted into those conversations more broadly and more powerfully. And the way to do that is to, again, support the companies are, that are gonna help Canada champion our position, whether it's you know, in payments or within lending. And so we have to pick these one or two winners because at the end of the day, that's what's gonna happen, which is, you know, you have a whole bunch of great ideas, but who can we help get to that sort of next stage of scale so that they can compete and represent Canada well at the global stage? Okay, uh, that, that's great. And I think let's, let's tie this into the, that global conversation because I think we can't really talk about Canada in isolation when it comes to FinTech when there are uh, major FinTech leaders uh, across the world. Uh, we're about 10 minutes uh, left, so I'm gonna, I'm sorry audience, but no questions for you. There is a break after this session, so I encourage you to grab these people as they're walking off stage and ask them whatever you would like. Um, before we go global, quick follow-up. Is the, the technology that Dream Payments is leveraging, is that accessible? Is that, is that cheap enough? Is it at um, uh, a scale and a price that an early stage startup can pick up, or is that? Um, so I, I wouldn't put it that way. I mean, the, our model wouldn't be to do that. So our model is that we can easily deploy um, it would still be under Dream. We, we do license the technology, but it's very easy to implement because of the, the cloud-based structure or model that we have, okay. right? So 
you can literally take a configured environment that's running, replicate it, plug it in and light it up. Okay. All right, let's, let's talk about the collaboration. And, and uh, as I said off the top, uh, scaling globally, when we're talking about investing in the future of fintech innovation in Canada, I think ha has to be on the table. Um, part of that is, is gonna come with collaboration and partnership between uh, fintechs, incumbents, the, the new disruptors, but then also uh, the regulating bodies. So I wanna, I wanna go to, let's go to Jeff first, and I wanna talk a little bit, I touched upon that, the partnership that you've done with, uh, with Touch Bistro. You've also done partnerships with uh, Staples, Everlink. I, I think uh, you can check out the coverage on Betakit, but these really cool partnerships where you, you're really tying in with a partner to access a vertical to provide lending to people who would probably never even think about it, especially like when we're talking the restaurant industry, uh, small, medium-sized businesses. Is, is that the kind of collaboration is required to kind of grow the pie and ex expand the market? I know we talk about, um, you know, the startup in the banks. I made a, a power financial joke off the top. You can all read about the, the money that they're throwing around investing in companies who are looking to go global. In, in your mind, what, what is the type of collaboration um, that is required uh, for Canadian fintechs to really thrive globally? Uh, I, I think uh, I think Brian Porter just answered that they uh, they have 28 million customers and and 150 year old brand, okay. you know. So uh, so so when you uh, when you've developed a, a great product or or where you've you've developed a, an innovative way to uh, to to attack a white space, uh, you you still you still need customers and you you need to you need to think about scale and you need to think about uh, mass adoption. And moving out of uh, your your niche that, that you could sell out of a, a call center or or Facebook ads in, into uh, you know into a very uh, very much a, a mainstream approach. So uh, so you know back back to the lending story. A big component in in lending is trust. Uh, while the technology supports um, an end-to-end -end lending application, our experience is such that that at some point in in the process, it's very important. Um, for for the borrower uh, to to know that they have the ability to interact with uh, with somebody uh, and and so much of that confidence uh, is is achieved when you can pair your application or you can skin your application in a trusted brand. Okay, is it, is that go beyond trust and thinking globally? Uh, is is a partnership at that level a bit of a shortcut to navigating the regulatory hurdles that you might see in other markets like in the UK, Australia, uh, different parts of Asia? Because uh, you know. 150 years of experience is gonna, they have that network globally to get past some things that maybe uh, a 20 person team based in Canada doesn't have the, uh, maybe the time to put towards that scaling process? Um, so so I, I strongly disagree that that's a shortcut. Uh, I, I would say that, that if, uh, if, if, a, if an institution with that level of credibility is, is prepared to attach their brand to, uh, to something you've built, uh, the amount of scrutiny that they will put on you uh, but before before doing so um, is is so unbelievably onerous um, and and time consuming and and expensive, uh, right rightly so uh, that 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 I would say uh, taking taking the partnership approach with an established brand uh, probably comes with a with a scrutiny that's far more severe than than you would experience if if you went at it alone. Okay. Well, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go to General then and get Pat in on this stuff. So then how do we how do we make that if we're talking about uh, investing in fintech innovation and making these conditions on the ground easier. General, how do we make those relationships? Your, your job is to help facilitate these relationships. How, I, I, what, what level of handshake can, can happen there where the scrutiny isn't a, a killer for small companies? Yeah, so you know, we have a number of programs that we developed uh, over the last two years to really help fintech companies in the growth and scale phases uh, to reach international markets but also try to expand their distribution nationally and so you know the partnership model that we have with corporates today or big incumbents is to really try to narrow down and identify areas of innovation that they really want to impact in the short term you know there are horizontal technologies like ai and blockchain and those are very much top of mind for many people but i would say that in the short term it's really about identifying what that journey looks like and figuring out which companies and fintechs fit within that sort of roadmap and then pairing them together and then identifying gaps within the enterprise or within their customer's experience and journey that they can help facilitate, improve, better, you know, and maybe in the end, our hope is that the fintech companies will benefit because it will help them expand their distribution, their customer base, and the big banks will see an opportunity to tack on 
some of their additional you know, products and services and enhance the experience. And so that's Mars' sort of role with the growth and scale companies. The earlier stage companies, we, we very much still keep an eye on. Okay. So like I mentioned earlier, you know, we don't shove them aside and we look for high potentials and those unicorns, quote unquote. But at the end of the day, our real purpose and goal is to help coach and mentor and support the ones that have market access and a, you know, a minimum viable product at the very least to speak to the incumbents and think about, again, international expansion because we always try to encourage that because I think, you know, market as a, you know, Canada as a market is still very small in many ways and while we, we truly believe that in, in order to be much more relevant uh, on the global stage, you need to, again, really think about, you know, which markets your product can be much more relevant in terms of scale as well because uh, six big banks in Canada, you know, it's, it's as, as mentioned before, it's a good base to start and to build that trust and collaboration and partnerships. Uh, but I think, again, it, it really comes down to how much bigger can Canadians think when it comes to building that sort of next billion dollar business okay. and competing with the other tech companies. I, I want to put a hold on the thinking big question and maybe we'll close on that. But uh, Pat, I got to get this to you because we're, we're talking about collaboration and scale from a relationship network model. But uh, regulators in Canada have done some work to provide pathways, right? So uh, I think the OSC and the CSA have agreements with uh, Australia and the UK to al allow Canadian fintech companies to, to travel to their innovation hubs, to get regulatory approval in, in those markets. Uh, do you want to tie that into maybe some of the other, sand, how that relates to a broader sandbox? Okay, so um, we're helping in a couple of ways. Number one, we've got a, <coughs> excuse me, a dedicated team for the fintechs that really have no idea about how regulation might apply. We're helping them and, and our, our goal is to modernize regulation. So we're gonna get out of the way if it doesn't make sense, as long as we built in investor protection. On the second piece, uh, we, we've, you've heard a lot globally about sandboxes and innovation hubs. Um, and what we're hearing from the fintechs is it's not enough to be operating in Canada alone. They need to be operating internationally. So we uh, developed the CSA regulatory sandbox so that the fintechs can come, uh, come to us, talk to us about their idea, and then hopefully get the, that type of sandbox relief across the country. And then secondly, we have entered into international cooperation agreements, the OSC has, uh, with the FCA in the UK and ASIC in Australia, because they have similar initiatives uh, where they're um, obviously trying to foster innovation in, in their uh, jurisdiction. So the idea is if, if you've come to us, we can refer you to um, ASIC or the FCA, or alternatively, if you've got a business in London, and you'd, and you'd like to come to Canada, you can come either to the CSA Sandbox or to OSC Launchpad. Okay, so now when we're talking about the, just back to that standardization question, Canadian FinTech company, uh, plane ticket to London, what's, what's the regulatory kind of overlap there? Is it one-to-one? Is it -one? I'm sure they show up and things work perfectly right away, or is it? No, and it is, it is a referral. Listen, I, I hear regulation getting in the way a lot. I have to be honest with you, I've, I've done a lot of traveling in the last six months as part of this initiative, and I think I'm hearing the same thing from fintechs, whether it's in the UK or in Europe. Um, I think they're all grappling with the same types of issues. Do, is there a need for global standards, especially around data? Yes, you know, um, but I think that all the regulators are attuned to it. Um, they're looking to foster innovation, and I think we're all really um, saying, come and talk to us, and, and we will get out of the way if, if it doesn't make sense. And, and I like how the CFC, CFTC put it this week. They said, we need to move from an analog environment to digital, and, and that's what we're all about. Okay. Um, we have just a little bit of time left. I'm going to take more time back. So I've stopped the audience from asking any questions, and I'm then taking more time from them on their break. But uh, the conversation is important. Uh, I think Gennaro touched on something uh, previously about the idea of uh, Canadians thinking a little bit bigger um, and kind of, you know, owning, owning the podium when it comes to fintech, where I think Canada has a lot of the infrastructure and the opportunity. Um, uh, Michael R. King, co-director of Scotiabank Digital Banking Lab at the Ivy Business School, Western University, said something similar in the Globe and Mail this past week, uh, but also said, uh, while we have all of those um, facets for opportunity, what we're missing is kind of uh, the leadership federally to have a unified strategy similar to what's happening uh, with AI in Canada, the, uh, the super cluster craziness that's going on with uh, daily announcements. Um, the uh, TF, 
uh, SA, the Toronto Financial Services Alliance, also released a report uh, for the same thing. Are we, um, and I will say personally in covering fintech, uh, predominantly the knock on Canadian fintech has that uh, for the most part, the, the products and services that have been rolled out have been uh, streamlined, digitized versions of traditional services. So when we talk about uh, uh, you know, owning the podium, thinking big, going global, and then true innovation, does that require uh, the federal leadership or is it things that we were talking before about AI and other technologies, investment in R&D to allow um, products that aren't just the digital versions of things we've had before from the incumbents? I'll, I'll, I'll open that up to everyone, whoever wants to jump in. So my, I can start. Um, I firmly believe and agree with Michael King's uh, op-ed in the Globe uh, with regards to uh, national level, federal level amount of leadership within this space. It's what sets us up, you know, at the high level of things as a as a country to make sure that all the players that uh, are involved and responsible for again moving the needle and increasing the pace at which we bring to market these products and solutions is really critical in order to compete, right? So that's the first point. And the second point is uh, around this whole notion of partnerships. We love this idea, but we need to, again, be more aggressive and hustle a little bit more to think about what other opportunities lie outside of Canada. And so, you know, from my perspective, when I look at uh, the initiatives and working groups that exist to help drive the industry as a whole from a regulatory standpoint, you know, from a partnership standpoint, from a collaboration, from an investment in talent, you know, we, we are very good at all those things. I think the challenge we always continually face is the pace at which we do them. Right, and that's the, that's the challenge we always face. And you know, in terms of where Canada can really differentiate itself, like the Vexter Institute is a perfect example of where Jeffrey Hinton is now leading that initiative, which is based at Mars. And we're very happy to see all these technology companies and banks be involved in that, uh, because it really does set us apart from what Canada can bring to the table in terms of horizontal technologies like AI, for example. And a lot of technology companies and banks have said, you know, this is gonna be a big part of our business, we want to be involved, we want to continue to support it, uh, but at the same time, Mars is an entity that wants to help accelerate that progress and that work. Okay, so uh, let's, get, let's get Christian and uh, Jeff in quickly and talk about from your perspective as being um, uh, Canadian FinTechs that I might have just uh, slightly undercut, but are you looking for that federal leadership? Are you looking, are you investing more in the technologies and services that are gonna allow you to do something next level beyond? What, what are you thinking about when you're thinking uh, future and that attitude and change? It's a good question. So, you know, uh, our perspective, we last year won uh, a global venture class competition at Yale University. And out of that, we got a $2 million investment in the company, um, a seat by Connecticut Innovations on the board, tremendous number of doors have opened up. We've opened an office out there where we're, it's a great soft landing into the US. Yeah, and we actually have a story about that coming up on Beta Kid. We did an interview at the latest Last VentureCast event. Okay. But I, I want to push you then, because that's, that's, you, that's your company winning a competition, getting uh, connected with uh, Ed educational institution in the right. US, you're doing that on your own. We're Talk doing to that me about what, what we need to get everyone. So, uh, you know, I, I think we do need leadership uh, at a, a government level, absolutely, to, to kind of set that tone and to get the message out there. But at the same time, um, you know, we have a lot of great innovation here, but we are limited in the resources and the institutions and the organizations that can provide that leadership. There's one Mars, that's it, and then there's a, num a tremendous amount of startups and fintechs and companies trying to get in through the same door, right? So yeah, okay, we have a, a global uh, sandbox that's opened up so that people can more easily test, but there's still some due diligence around there. And as successful as you are in Canada, um, you have to go global, and you either do it earlier or later. Okay. And you, the government will help facilitate and set some standards and get the message out there right, that, you know, Canada, and we're starting to see that, right, Toronto's a fintech hub. Uh, there, we need a lot more of that because what's happening is these, the millennial talent, which is, is the, the most important resource for these companies to succeed, you know what they're doing? They're just going across the border and they're getting paid four times as yeah. much as they so, are now. Yeah. And to, to budget 2017 uh, had the word innovation in it, I think one bazillion times, but mentioned fintech only three times. 
So a point of focus is something. I, uh, I think I'm going to give Justin a final word because I, I don't think Pat's going to want to comment on what the federal government should be doing to set leadership conditions for fintech in Canada. So Jeff, uh, close us out. What are, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, so so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little anecdote. Uh, I accompanied Mayor Tory in November uh, on, on a trip to Israel, uh, fintech and cyber focused. Uh, and and uh, I watched him absorb so much of uh, of the learnings that uh, uh, that Israel had for uh, for for the technology community, um, and and I mean this guy left with with a binder of uh, of new ideas, and and every single day there were dozens and dozens of uh, of, of new innovations. You know, one one that uh, that stands out. Um, libraries are usually you know massive have massive footprints. But people don't really consume, you know, books from libraries anymore. Uh, so, so they were turning libraries into, uh, you know, free space for technology incubators, mm -hmm. as uh, as an example. Just, just amazing, amazing ideas. So, uh, so, so what what has to happen? Uh, we we have to take ownership of the fact that we're late to the game. We have to take ownership of the fact that um, others have unbelievable um, ideas that that are being executed on. Um, we have to. Um, as you know, I, I tell everybody that's uh, that's that's you know starting up a fintech business. First thing you want to do, okay, um, you want to go get on a plane to the most developed environment that uh, you know that exists for your space and talk to as many people as uh, as you possibly can. And then you know come come back. The the chances are um, a a Canadian version of that either you know doesn't exist or or is in some you know nascent form. And that in itself is is an opportunity. I think that's a perfect place to leave it around ownership. Uh, I'd like to thank panelists for joining me today. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh